Section 12 of From the Easy Chair, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in November 2017. From the Easy Chair, Volume 3, by George William Curtis. Section 12 reception to the japanese ambassadors at the white house herr teufelsdrock informs those who read his famous book the tailor sewer over or the philosophy of clothes that mr pelham announces among other canons regulating human apparel that it is permitted to mankind under certain conditions to wear white waistcoats but now it appears that under certain conditions also straw-coloured gloves are not only permissible but imperative when a japanese ambassador appears and the white flag with the orb of day in its centre is unfurled straw colour as to the hands is the only wear therefore when the reception was to take place in washington the deeply initiated held hands of that mystic colour the only chagrin was that nobody seemed to know the significant fact nor to care for it and one honourable gentleman asked with interest whether it would not be extremely orthodox to wear a straw hat but these levities were ill becoming the august occasion the feast of the straw-coloured gloves in honour of the japanese ambassadors fell upon an evening when the poetic policeman thought of every bell who stepped from her carriage the bleak winds of march made her tremble and shiver but he thought it only he did not say it yet the bleak wind of the cold night had little chance at the guests for a pavilion was laid to the very curbstone and every one stepped out into friendly shelter then up the steep stairs just as the illustrious guests were passing from the cloak-room to the hall as they entered it the crowd swelling upward from the door below made for the ladies room or for the little hole in a corner into which the gentlemen were to thrust their coats in the vague hope that they might be recovered some of the japs who at a later hour were buffeting the crowd and struggling towards the aperture must have been impressed if they were philosophers with the fact that a nation of so many happy contrivances as they fondly believe us to be has not yet learned how to take charge of overcoats at public feasts it would not be very difficult to avoid the fierce crush at the cloak-room but it is not avoided and it is as good-humoured as it is disagreeable and unnecessary but who cared for the crush at the door of the opera house on a jenny lind night when coat skirts strewed the pavement and the most elaborately tied cravats were undone not otherwise was this pressure when the door was passed and the pretty hall entered was this also an opera and had the curtain risen for the first impression of the brilliant scene was that of the trilling and warbling of canaries in clusters of cages hung high overhead and for a moment giving a sense of enchanted gardens and rose bowers upon bendemeer's stream was this impression disturbed when from their tiring room the nymphs and dames emerged powdered beflowered effulgent there were toilets of all kinds there were even ladies in bonnets as if they had run in neighbourly to hobnob an hour with ivakura there were others in the very extreme of fashion there was every kind of tasteful and rich and beautiful and plain and grotesque attire and now and then behold the ineffable calm of the lady not one but many of whom mr emerson tells the excellent story that she said to feel herself perfectly well dressed imparted a tranquil happiness that religion itself could not bestow the hall was very light draped and festooned simply with the american and two japanese flag intertwined the whole giving a certain gauzy effect which was pretty if not fairy-like nor magnificent upon a little platform at the end of the hall stood the guest and other distinguished ministers the space in the middle of the hall between improvised columns was kept clear for some time so that the picture was charming 
the throng pressed slowly up one side of the room towards the platform and passing across it in front of the various members of the embassy were received by the secretary of state and the japanese minister and by the latter presented to iwakura he was dressed with all his associates in the sad sables with which western nations mourn their own gaiety instead of some glittering cloth of gold in which whatever the fact may have been at the white house we might have expected an ambassador from chipango or el dorado to be arrayed we had the familiar and useful black broadcloth coat and trousers of civilization but when sir philip sidney in flowered velvet was presented to the great william of orange william was clad in a plain serge coat and sir philip probably did not know it or forgot it and as the gallant sydneys at this feast were presented to the chief ambassador they doubtless saw the man and not his clothes iwakura is about fifty years old not a large man of great dignity and serenity of character and manners with a high-bred and elegant air and a face of clear intelligence and refinement he bowed courteously to every guest with a subtle distance of salutation without offence which is peculiar to many men of high self-respect handshaking is the most religiously observed of all the social rites in washington and especially and amusingly by the diplomatic corps who evidently constrain themselves to observe punctually this sacred habit but iwakura did not offer his hand yet did not refuse to engage in the ceremony when it was unavoidable beyond him in the line were the chief ladies of the occasion the wives of the vice-president of the secretary of state of the speaker and of the other secretaries it was simply a republican court recalling the days when president washington and his wife stood upon a slightly raised dais at the end of the hall there being about those three inches of monarchy left at the beginning of the republic before thomas jefferson alighting from his horse hitched him by the bridle to the fence and then went into the capital to be inaugurated president descending from the immediate presence the guests gathered in lines along the hall or slowly promenaded engaged in watching and in criticizing each other meanwhile the band played and the canaries excited by the music and the lights sang loud and clear not so sweetly sang the gossips as they whispered and exclaimed at each other's fresh oddity or extravagance of attire gently good gossips gently for even at this moment is the scripture fulfilled and ye who judge are judged in a world where martin farquhar tupper passes to the thirty-seventh edition said thackeray in a company of authors let us all think small beer of ourselves when to the eye of men the dress of the fairer sex is altogether bewildering and certainly not as professor teufelstrock would say unbeautiful why should the good gossip individually discriminate peace peace the sober matron at whom you smile wears the plain dress because she preferred to pay her boy's college bills with the money that would have arrayed her in parisian robes had he stayed at home and you dear madam daughter of fortunatus and heiress of his purse you wear those ponderous diamonds and nudge your neighbours to look and laugh with you hark the soft prelude of the waltz what is the mysterious pathos of that long pulsing strain why is that measure moving to which the joy and the hope of youth celebrate their triumph of all measures the most passionately sad one after another the partners glide into the dance they swim they float they circle they move in music and to music and what is this and who is here this comet this meteor of a couple who come pumping and dashing through the throng are her hands really laid upon his shoulders do his hands clasp her elbows or is it an extraordinary dream no wonder that japan draws to the edge of the dais and gazes in wonder for america also looks on in amazement the amused incredulity of the foreign guests as they watch the dancing is interesting to see iwakura regards the scene with smiling gravity 
to him the spectacle seems a thousandfold more against nature than the vision of a woman voting can possibly be to the most conservative american yet the ambassador will find that the loveliest woman may waltz with a man and still be womanly and the conservative american may go and do likewise the fashions of a time and the traditions of a nation are not the final laws of nature and even horatio's philosophy does not exhaust the things in heaven and earth that are yet to be the ambassadors are still gazing the band is still playing and the birds are still singing over the happy dancers as we come away there is a desperate but brief struggle at the orifice in the corner whence to our delight our coats emerge we have a glimpse into the ladies tiring room where like bright-winged birds they are pluming themselves for flight upon the steep staircase where they stand waiting for their carriages there is tranquillity and order so excellent are the arrangements scores of sentences are left in fragments upon the stairs for in the midst of a remark the cry resounds the honourable mr iago's carriage mrs bluebird's the ambassador from san salvador mr smith jones's carriage and instantly the bright-winged birds are flown and rosebuds and violets go home to happy dreams end of section twelve section thirteen from the easy chair volume three this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Easy Chair, Volume 3, by George William Curtis. Section 13. The Maid and the Wit. The fabled stream that sank from sight and emerged far away still flowing is an image of the course of all progress. The argument which establishes the reason and the benefit of reform does not, therefore, at once establish it still less complete it there are obstructions delays disappearances but still the stream flows seen or unseen still it swells and reappearing far beyond where it vanished moves brimming to the sea the lady mavernine who coming to us straight from paris found here a courteous regard for women which she said that after a life's residence she had not found in france was only just to americans nowhere is there such instinctive and universal consideration for the gentler sex notwithstanding the occasional spectacle of the woman standing in the elevated railroad car and the necessity under which the elderly wit found himself in the omnibus when seeing a comely young woman standing he said to his son sitting in his lap my son why don't you get up and give the lady your seat despite such gaiety in the omnibus and such devout reading of the newspapers in the elevated cars that the devotees cannot see women standing even those women if they are travelled would agree that upon the whole in no civilized country have they encountered more deference to the sex as such than in america yet the courtesy is that of a clever as well as polite people if the comely maid in the omnibus had suddenly and sweetly asked the elderly wit whether he was a true american and believe that taxation and representation should go together he would promptly have replied yes ma'am but if she had then whipped out her logical rapier and thrust at him the question are you then in favor of giving me a vote his cleverness and his courtesy would have blended in his reply madam when women demand it they will have it it is the universal reply of the ingenious patriot who is aware that the argument is against him but who is still unconvinced the stream of logic sinks in the sands of his scepticism but it will reappear still further on flowing with a fuller current towards its goal if the omnibus were a convenient ground for such bouts of argument the maid has plenty of other keen rapiers in reserve with which she would pierce his courteous incredulity one of the sharpest would be the rejoinder of inquiry whether it was the general custom of legislatures to wait until everybody interested in a reform asked for it before granting it having inserted the point of the weapon she would turn it around to the great inconvenience of the elderly wit by further asking specifically whether imprisonment for debt was abolished because poor debtors as a body requested it or because it was deemed best in the general interest that it should be abolished or whether hanging for stealing a leg of mutton was renounced because the hapless thieves demanded it or because romilly showed that humanity and the welfare of society 
and of respect for law, required it. The comely maid once aroused would not spare him, and while declining to occupy his son's seat, she would challenge him to say whether the slave trade was stopped, and the West Indian slaves emancipated by England, because the slaves petitioned, or because Parliament thought such reforms desirable for the interests of England. That inquiry, doubtless, she would have pushed more closely home, and there would have been no escape for the nimble wit except in some happy and elusive epigram. Nothing would have followed. He would have lifted his hat courteously as the lady smiled and left the omnibus. The stream of logic would have disappeared, but its volume would have been stronger, and when it reappeared it would have been flowing nearer its goal. The comely maid recently smiled, probably as if she saw the reappearance when she learned that venerable Yale, even before venerable Harvard, had opened her postgraduate courses upon absolutely the same conditions to women as to men. This is not co-education. Far from it. It is as far as eleven o'clock from twelve. Still less is it co-suffrage. No, indeed. It is as different as the blossom of May from the fruit of September. It means no more than that the good sense of Yale, perceiving that there is a goodly company of women actually devoted to higher studies, and not perceiving anything unwomanly or undesirable in larger knowledge and stricter intellectual training, invites Hepatia and Mrs. Somerville and Maria Mitchell to avail themselves of her opportunities and resources to prosecute their studies, and recognizes that in a modern world of larger and juster views which permits women to use every industrial faculty to the utmost and to own property and dispose of it, it is useless longer to insist with chivalry that woman is a goddess too bright and too good, or with the Orient that she is a slave in this world and a houri in the next. As for the logic of such an invitation, Yale is doubtless indifferent. She invites women to study not with her undergraduates, but with her postgraduates. Probably she recoils with instinctive conservatism from the vision of a possible Hypatia seated among her faculty in a professorial chair. That might do in Alexandria in the fifth century, but in New Haven in the nineteenth, or even the twentieth? She recoils still further from the prospect of co-voting. Elizabeth Tudor was a credible head of a kingdom and a fellow counselor of state with Burley and Walsingham. But does it follow that a Connecticut woman possessed of great estates should have a voice in the disposition of her property? Probably Yale would agree that when all such amply endowed women unite in asking for such a voice, it might be worth while to consider. Meanwhile, she opens the hospitable doors of her postgraduate intellectual treasury, and every woman who will may enter and share the riches. Oliver asked for more, but not until he had consumed his portion. The comely maid of the omnibus smiles as she sees those treasury doors hospitably opening. She seems perhaps to see the stream of logic at once vanishing and reappearing. If a woman may mingle wisely with postgraduates, why not with under? But no. Something, she would say with womanly good sense, may be left to time in the inevitable sequence of events. Shall all be done at once, and the sound seed be spurned, because it must be planted and grow and ripen before there is a harvest? In this Columbian year shall we think that nothing was gained when Columbus reached San Salvador, as we used to be taught, or Watling Island, or Grand Turk, or Samana, among which bewildered knowledge now doubtfully gropes, because he had not reached the continent, and because he believed it to be the old, and not a new, India? That comely damsel, with her face towards the morning, says quietly with Durandarty, Patience and shuffle the cards. One glance at the woman in the Athens of Pericles, and at woman in the New Haven of President Dwight, answers the question which the nimble elderly wit eluded. End of section 13. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 14 of From the Easy Chair, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Easy Chair, Volume 3, by George William Curtis. Section 14. The Departure of the Great Eastern. I saw the Great Eastern sail away. The afternoon was exquisite, one of the cool, clear, perfect days that followed the storm in the middle of August. And it seemed to hang over the great ship like a cordial smile. 
but it was the only smile the poor leviathan received. There was a Christian resignation in her departure. The big ship, like Falstaff, made a finer end and went away, and it had been any Christom child, a part at even just between four and five, even at turning of the tide. But as when a prince is born, and the bells are rung, and the cannon fired, and the city is illuminated, and with music and shouting the people swarm the streets, and when the same prince, grown to be a bad king and tyrant, dies, outcast and condemned, with never a tear to fall nor a bell to toll for him, even such was the coming and going of the great eastern. I remember also the June afternoon when she arrived, and at the same hour. The city was excited as London used to be by the news of a famous victory. It was reported early in the morning that she was below, and public expectation, which had been feeding upon print and picture of her, was dispatching the population to the battery, to the wharves, to the excursion boats, and wherever she could be seen. At four o'clock you could see, off Staten Island, a pyramid of towering masts above all other masts. She looked a mighty admiral, and as she came up the bay attended by the little boats, for all other craft are little beside her, you could easily remember the approach of Columbus to the shore and the canoes of curious savages that darted and swarmed around his ship. Her very size gave her a kind of superiority. The silence of her progress was full of majesty. The shores teemed with people. The heights of Staten Island twinkled and fluttered with the gay toilets of the spectators that covered them. The Jersey shores were alive. The battery looked white with human faces, the piers upon the river, the decks of vessels in the stream, and the windows and roofs of the buildings that commanded the water were crowded with eager watchers. But the prettiest sight was the convoy of every kind that attended the surprising guest. Yachts, sloops, schooners, steamers and tow-boats, large and small, moved down towards her, came out from the shore, sailed round her, sailed beside her, crossed her bows, followed her, so that the bay was bewitched with excitement. Cannon roared, bells rang, flags waved, and the crowd huzzahed welcome. Through all the great ship glided majestically on. In response to each fresh salute of steam whistle, the bell was touched upon the deck. It was the quiet nod or smile of a prince in reply to the noisy complimenting of a common council. There was an air of dignity and of grandeur in the size and movement of the ship, and as the public was not disappointed in her size, but found that she really looked as large as she had been described and represented, and as every circumstance of her arrival was propitious, so that she slipped quietly into her dock like a ferry-boat, it may fairly be claimed that the Great Eastern had already won the hearty regard of the New York public. How she lost it, is it not all related in indignant reports and letters and caricatures? How she dared to charge a dollar for admission? How hapless sailors lost their lives? How she went to Cape May, and there black night rushes down upon the tail? After a visit of forty-nine days in which she had unhappily but too surely worn out her welcome, she prepares to depart, but at the last moment petty suits almost detain her. She shakes them off, however, and with them the cables that bound her to our shore. She slips into the stream. She promptly points her head down the bay. It is a lovely afternoon. It is the same river full of craft. There are the wharves, the windows, the roofs. But where, oh where, are the people? She fires her departing gun. A few loiterers whom chance or business is called to the waterside look up for a moment as she goes by. Idle boys upon the wharves joke and jeer at her. Where are the wolves, naughty boys? How dare you cry bald head? Everything in the river in the city slouches in the everyday costume of habit. There are no gala garments, no fluttering flags and merry bells and booming guns and cheering crowds. The Great Eastern is going away. Who cares? She will never come back. So much the better. Alas, the poor old king of yesterday is dying and there is no one to close his eyes. No, the courtiers are booted and spurred to dash away the moment the breath is out of his body and salute the young prince, the next sensation who shall rule the realm for a day. When she came in I saw her come up the bay. I saw her come down as she departed. 
in the distance blending with the spires of the city and the lesser masts there was the towering cluster rising above all i listened for the guns i looked for the attendant craft there were neither except a brief salute from the cunarder in port but the bay of new york will be watched for many a year before so grand and stately a sight will be seen again as that great ship making her way through the narrows to the sea when she entered the bay she seemed majestic and conciliatory as she left it she was majestic and disdainful yet this was only the impression of a moment and of the distance as she neared the forts at the narrows entirely alone with no accompanying steam or sail vessel with all the hard luck of her life behind her and following her even to the latest hour of her stay in america with the fact that she had utterly lost all hold upon public interest made glaringly palpable by the absolute loneliness of her departure she yet fired a proud salute as she swept out of the upper bay a stern farewell that echoed coldly from unanswering shores and with the stars and stripes floating at her peak magnificent and majestic the great eastern departed gradually as she passed far down the lower bay she returned into the same hazy vastness that i remembered when i first saw her in which in the memories of all who saw her she will forever remain End of section 14. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 15 of From the Easy Chair, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Easy Chair, Volume 3 by George William Curtis. Section 15. Church Street. On the earliest of the really spring-like mornings, as the easy chair turned into Church Street, it could not help perceiving that in some romantic ways the New Yorker has the advantage of the Londoner and Parisian. Church Street does not indeed seem at the first mention to be a promising domain of romance, nor a fond haunt of the muses. Indeed, it must not be denied that it has an unsavory name, and when the city loiterer recalls Wapping, or a main morning on the Seine Keys, he will smile at Church Street as a field of romance, and the easy chair grants him absolution. London, perhaps, does not strike the American imagination, or let us more truly say the imagination of the traveling American, as a romantic city. That citizen of the world reserves for himself Venice, Constantinople, Grand Cairo. Yet if after his arrival he will buy Peter Cunningham's Handbook for London, at the nearest bookstore, and turn its pages slowly, he will discover that for him an american he is in a very romantic city indeed mr hepworth dixon's tower of london will show him how copious a sermon may be preached from one romantic text of course he can be expected to have no feeling but pity for the unfortunates who fill the streets and whose fate it was to be born britishers yet let him reflect that it was not their fault and except for that precise unhappy fact of being britishers which causes all the mischief their parents, too, would have lived elsewhere. Then the American citizen of the world, pitying England, will cross to France, to another country, a new world, and in Paris will breathe more freely as being at last in the metropolis of the globe, always excepting New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Cincinnati, or Chicago, as the case may be. If he opens Galignani's guide, the excellent and well-informed traveler will immediately discover that he is in another romantic city and that there is something more to see and consider than the bal d'opera and the chateau rouge and if some easy chair accidentally encountered straying along the boulevards or seated at the door of a cafe should chance to ask whether the well-informed traveller had ever taken a romantic stroll in church street new york he would be rewarded with a smile for his admirable humour by and by after the coffee was drunk and the pipe smoked out the easy chair and his approving mentor would perhaps stroll about until they came far away from the haunts of today to the respectable old place louis quinze it is always an attractive spot for that well-informed traveller he looks at it with pensive emotion and turns warmly to the easy chair and says how delightful this is here dwelt the noblesse this is the fifth avenue what do i say the murray hill of old paris and now all is gone fashion is an emigre inquire in the faubourg saint germain 
What a pity we have nothing of this kind in America. But we have, replies the easy chair. The incredulous well-informed traveler again smiles a mild, melancholy smile at the inscrutable methods of Providence, which has provided no plus Louis Keens for the Yankees and Aborigines. We certainly have, persists the easy chair. Where, pray? Well, Church Street. The reply seems to be beating out a jest very thin, but gradually the easy chair contrives to explain. The movement of life in New York is so rapid, fashion and trade sweep from one point to another with such impetuosity, that the romance of a changed interest can be enjoyed in the same spot twice or thrice in a lifetime. In older cities, in Paris or London, it is not the individual experience but history only which covers the change. The gentlemen and dames of the Louis Keynes era do not moralize over the place from which the glory has departed, but only their descendants. The change is so gradual that it is not within their personal experience. It is a tide that rises and falls once in six score years, not in six hours. But the fortunate New Yorker has his romance making for him while he sleeps. The sorry streets of today will disappear within a dozen years, and the instant they are gone, or seen just at the moment of the final lapse, they have passed into the realm of romance. Here is Church Street, for instance. It is not very long, and you turn into it from Fulton or from Canal. So turned the easy chair, and there was the long, narrow vista walled by lofty buildings, the spacious houses of trade built yesterday, piled with dry goods, bold with prosperous newness, but instantly suggesting the street of palaces in Genoa. And a few rods off, some old knickerbocker is gravely stalking down Broadway who has not turned aside into Church Street for many a year and who supposes Church Street is still a place not to be named, an unspeakable Gehenna. So it was a dozen years ago. Once also it was the Black Broadway. It was a kind of voluntary ghetto of the colored people. Then again it was an offshoot of the Five Points. There were low ranges of dingy buildings. Dirty men and women slouched along on the walks and lounged out of the windows, and their idle ribald laughter echoed along the street that few carriages traveled. Dens of every kind were just around every corner. Slatternly women emptied slops upon the pavement, and the stench was perpetual. Dirty little children screamed and played, and sickly babies squalled unheeded. It was a street fallen out of Hogarth, the street of worst repute in the city. And now it is a double range of stately buildings, symmetrical, massive, horse cars struggle on it with light carts of dry goods dealers, with the slow enormous teams that shake the ground. At every corner there is an inextricable snarl of wagons and porters are heaving boxes and young clerks are directing, and huge windows are filled with huge pattern cards, so that the narrow way is tapestried. Look out there, cries a porter, compelling the clerk to the easy chair, which smiles to think that only yesterday it was in Exchange Place, and Pearl Street, and elsewhere, that the peremptory youth was ordering him to mind his eyes. And if the employer who now sits in the spacious office opposite had known that his clerk was familiar with Church Street, he would have warned him of the gates of destruction, and have admonished him that Church Street, though a narrow street, was a broad way. The people that push and hurry and skip along this busy avenue are alert and well-dressed. The slouchers and loungers, the old slatterns with the slop pails, the fat, frowsy, jolly, dirty women with bare red arms and loud voices, the sneaks, the thieves, and the unclean groups at the grog shop, where are they? No sneaks now. No thieves. Honorable gentlemen with clean collars everywhere. What a consolation. As you watch the passers closely, as you read the signs, it occurs to you that the population with the universal tendency in our mental and spiritual habits that Matthew Arnold sparklingly deplores, is clearly Hebraized. Here, where this especially fine warehouse or handsome shop stand stood the French church. It has jumped up town a few miles. Here was the church of Dr. Potts. Could you believe that the people who go to meeting in the snug brown little edifice in an ivy mantle at the corner of University Place and Tenth Street, which probably seems to the young clerk coeval with the city, day before yesterday as it were, came down here among the merchants? Then they came once a week for an hour or two. What did you say was the name of the deity to whom these temples were dedicated? And at this corner, 
why if it were an april thicket it could not more sweetly bubble with song only this music is the spirit ditty of no tone here was the old national theatre do you see that very respectable old gentleman in the office who carries an ostrich egg in his hat for so his grandchildren describe grandpapa's baldness he sits and reads the paper and is presently going down to the bank of which he is a director and of which he seems always to those grandchildren to smell so tenacious is the peculiar odor of a bank that is the very gentleman who in the temple of the drama upon this spot used to lead the loud applause and at whom in his buckish costume of those merry days and nights the lovely sharif herself used to level her eyes and her voice as she trilled oh whistle and i'll come to you my lad can you imagine that excellent grandparent kissing his hand rapturously to the retiring prima donna going off to sup at the cafe de l'independence and hieing home at two in the morning waking the echoes of murray street with a reproduction of that arch song followed by a loud whistle to prove whether that vision of delight really will come to him, and bringing only the gruff Charlie, obese guardian of the night. Will you find in your famous Place Louis Quinze any roisterer of the Regency grown old and careful of his diet? Here is one wall which survives from the prehistoric days of thirty years ago. It is the rear wall of the old hospital, that blessed green spot in the midst of the city, which is to be green no more but will soon be piled with more palaces. And opposite this wall is a short street running from church to West Broadway. A few years ago this was one of the worst of city slums. At the corner of West Broadway a wooden building still remains, a sullen, sickly, defiant cur of a building that sits and snarls, impotent over the savagery departed. And there is one tall rookery still, a tenement house with a system of fire escapes in front, and the slattern slopping at the curb as in the ancient day and a cooper's shop and a blacksmith's and one two three how many whiskey shops but they are all faint and feeble and submerged in the lofty buildings and to-morrow all trace of them will be gone and then who will remember the murder the mysterious awful romantic murder the murder that filled all the newspapers and fed speculation at all corner groggeries and in all offices the murder that was done into a romance, and of which the hero, that is, the murderer, was acquitted, after one of the famous eloquent criminal appeals which are so effective because their power is measured by human life. And this hero occasionally reappears in the newspapers even to this day. Somebody writes from a remote somewhere that on a steamer far away a mysterious man, after much mysterious conduct, imparts the awful truth that he is the hero. Does he sometimes return to this spot? Does he look at the side of the house where the deed was done? Does he appear in the guise of a merchant, a jobber, a retailer from that remote southwestern somewhere, and higgle and chaffer in the noble warehouse on the very side of the wretched building where he murdered his mistress? Good heavens! Do you see that man of about those years looking about as if to find a sign or number? As if he didn't know the very place as if it were not burned and cut into his heart and conscience. Do you think it could possibly be he? Or is it, after all, only the honest Timothy Tape, the modest retailer from Scowegan or Palmyra? The typhus fever used to rage here. The cholera was fearful. The sanitary reports say that there were always cases of the worst diseases to be found here. The city missionaries also used to find their worst cases here, too. And now... What cleanliness of collar! What modishness of coat! No more sin! What a consolation! And so as the easy chair strolled along, bumped and hustled and severely looked upon by the eager throng in the narrow street, more radically reconstructed than any doubtful state, it could not help feeling that London with Her Majesty's Tower, and Paris with her deserted Place Louis Quinze, are not the only romantic cities in the world and that a city of such rapid and incessant change as new york offers even some poetic aspects which its elder sisters want the easy chair is pleaded formally for some respect towards old historic buildings like the old state house in boston for instance and has been indignantly laughed at for its pains it will not deny that unabashed by such laughter it contemplates the old walton house with satisfaction it repairs also to the corner of broad and pearl streets 
and reflecting upon general washington's parting with his officers turns its eyes towards wall street and beholds the grecian temple which has taken the place of the old city hall upon whose balcony the first predecessor of president grant was inaugurated but the romance of church street is of another kind it is the romance of striking and sudden change merely not of historic interest nor of personal association perhaps the gentle reader may not find it when he goes there then let him carry it end of section fifteen recording by philip gould section sixteen from the easy chair volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by d l archer from the easy chair volume three by george william curtis section sixteen historic buildings a few months ago the easy chair seeing that changes were making in the old state house in boston one of the few revolutionary and truly historic buildings that remain modestly ventured to regret it and to deplore the rapid disappearance of the venerable relics that had come down to us from former generations it suggested or meant to suggest or might could would or should have suggested and will now under correction suggest that there are very few buildings in new york which recall that earlier epoch of the country with a national and pardonable logic or association of ideas the easy chair enlarged upon the value of historic relics of monuments of visible traditions and urged possibly that it made life a little barer a little less poetic here than it would otherwise be the temerity of such a strain of remark does not seem very extravagant it might indeed be put forth without any secret hostility to human rights to liberty to the equality of men and even without a sigh for the repose of a fet despotism and the traditions of outworn monarchies but not in the opinion of a certain excellent journal which we will agree to call the bugle of freedom and which blew a sonorous blast and rallying cry against the sentiments of the easy chair's mild and innocent suggestions monuments blew the bugle of freedom monuments remains traditions old lumber and rotten timber what in the name of humanity have all these to do with a manly and patriotic sentiment look at egypt what have the pyramids done for the civilization of egypt and we hope they are monuments and ancient enough look at greece the very queen mother of the noblest architecture look at italy teeming with storied monuments and what do we see played the bugle of freedom what do we see do we wish to be egyptians or modern greeks or italians heaven forbid and the resounding bugle seemed to execute roulades and runs and trills of contempt at the unhappy easy chair which was gazing vacantly at egypt greece and italy as the bugle had directed has the bugle of freedom no drawer or box or casket of any kind in which there is possibly a yellow rose bud faded years and years ago in the days when it was a mere raw shrill piping flageolet has it no bundle of letters worn and parted at the seam no knotted handkerchief hidden out of sight that shall never be more unknotted no glove delicate and perfumed still holding the form gained by soft pressure upon a hand that shall never again be pressed is there no tree in the garden in a public square by the roadside in a green field by a brook under which at every hour of the day and night whenever and with whomsoever it is passed there stand the youth and the maid who shall be seen of men no more is there no house in town or country from whose windows long vanished faces look when the bugle passes by and in whose unchanged rooms there are figures of old and young whose presence is infinitely tender and chastening would life be richer and better and more manly and inspiring for the bugle if all these were swept away would the rights of man and external justice be more secure if some morning biddy should throw old letters old rosebuds and old handkerchiefs into the fire and the woodman would not spare the old tree and the haunted old household be burned up or pulled down that is the whole question 
It is merely a matter of association. It is in human nature the easy chair did not put it there. The mysterious delight in the most ancient and inarticulate remains of human skill is the recognition by the soul of man of its identity and endless continuation. And when you descend from the Cyclopean work in the foundation of the wall of the temple at Jerusalem to the knotted handkerchief and the yellow bud, you have only come, O bugle, to the individual delight in one's own experience, to the unsealing of sweet fountains forgotten, and the quickening of sanitary emotions. Surely, when you were traveling and delighting yourselves in Greece, you did not come upon the plain of Marathon with the same emotion that you crossed the Hackensack Meadows in the Philadelphia train. But what was the difference? Byron's lines sang themselves out of your mouth. The mountains look upon Marathon, and Marathon looks upon the sea. Why did Byron's lines rise in your memory? Why did Byron write the lines? Why was your glance eager and your mind pensive and your imagination alert and your soul full of generous impulse when you stood on the plain of Marathon? Because of the great conflict between two civilizations long and long and long ago, the conflict of ideas of which you are the child, the conflict of men essentially like you and your brothers who fought at Gettysburg and Vicksburg. But if there be this subtle and overpowering influence in association with a place, although it is earth and trees and grass and stone, is there not the same charm and power in association with a building, a tree, a stream? And while Marathon has not saved Greece from decline, has it not been one of the natural influences that have pleaded against national decay? And could Marathon and Salamis and Plataea have been swept out of mind? Would not the decline have been a thousandfold hastened? Are we not stronger and braver for Bunker Hill and Saratoga, for the sunken Alabama and the wilderness? For the same reason, O oh loud blowing bugle of freedom, that it would be a national injury to forget the great deeds, it is in a lesser degree a misfortune, although an inevitable one, gradually to lose from sight the objects that recall them. Would it be a pity to shovel Bunker Hill into Boston Back Bay? The Battle of Bunker Hill would still remain in history. The advantages of the Revolutionary War which it began would still survive. But something we should have lost, and the argument that urged the sparing of the hill would be sound and natural. So with the old State House. To destroy it or essentially to change it was in a lesser degree to shovel Bunker Hill into the Back Bay. The town of Stratford-upon-Avon seemed not to be conscious of the great truth which the easy chair is expounding when it seemed disposed to let the house of Shakespeare be sold, and even moved away. But England at least was wiser, and the house remains. Some day, and the easy chair dedicates the remark as a conciliatory conclusion to the bugle of freedom, some day the bugles of that same honored name will gaze at the present printing office where a sympathetic easy chair thrusts the job are many and profitable and will say with emotion there the parental bugle of freedom blew its melodious note it will do the buglets no harm as they return to their palatial mansions to reflect upon the simple and sturdy origin of their prosperity the easy chair has the more feeling upon this subject because directly opposite to the vast and many-windowed building from which it surveys the world stands the old walton house eighty years ago it was one of the finest houses in town the square where now business hums and roars then softly murmured with fashion and this was the faubourg street honore of the republican city the house still has the stately air of the old regime. The stone pediment of the windows is elaborate and arrests the idle eye, but it is now a sailor's boarding house. The walls are cracked, and the house has an indescribable aspect of shabbiness and neglect. Surrounded by the mere mob of three-storied modern brick buildings, it has evidently become reckless and lost to shame, like a king's heir fallen into debauched and degraded courses long since slighted and forgotten its peers utterly gone their descendants moved miles away and become a modern generation without the reservoir on murray hill the easy chair has yet more than once 
late on a summer afternoon when trade had gone uptown and silence and dreams were setting in beheld the old walton house glancing covertly across the street at our modern many-windowed bustling palace of busy traffic with a look of high-born haughtiness and contempt there may be trade going on within my walls it seemed to say as it gazes but i am innocent of it i was not built for trade at least and then the easy chair with its own eyes fixed upon the cracked and leaning walls seemed to see it reeling away into its dingy obscurity it is a tradition of franklin square that washington once lived in the walton house and it is certain that citizen Genet married there the daughter of governor george clinton once indeed some years since the easy chair hearing an extraordinary and novel sound like the smooth rolling of a stately chariot thought as the day was late and the twilight was already beginning that some of the fine old societies of that fine old day had somehow forgotten themselves into somehow returning to the scene of so much last century festivity and anxious to see both them and their amazement at the transformation of the fashionable square rolled itself to the window and looking out saw the first horse car rumbling gravely along to the neighboring ferry remaining at the window and mindful of washington at the old walton house the easy chair was aware of mercury who runs the editorial errands and is a much meditating young messenger standing by his side with one of the editorial brethren mercury said the editorial brother do you know who washington was the father of this country promptly replied the messenger and what did he ever do that was notorious and disreputable mercury was plainly indignant at this question and answered evasively well he never told a lie if he did chop down his father's apple tree and what else did he do with energy mercury responded he whipped the bloody britishers and what became of him when he grew up he was president mercury said the editorial brother do you see that house across the street the old walton house the old walton house of course i do well mercury he lived there who lived there demanded mercury with wide opening eyes george washington lived in the old walton house but not the same george asked mercury doubtfully not the first president the first woodchopper of fame and the first president replied the brother quill mercury gazed at the house earnestly for a little while and then warmly demanded why don't they keep his old signboard up to let the folks know bugle of freedom out of the mouths of babes and sucklings the truth proceeds it was the same instinct that caused the easy chair to exclaim a year ago as it contemplated the prospect of changing the old and famous state house why take the old sign down Section 17 of From the Easy Chair, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Easy Chair, Volume 3 by George William Curtis. Section 17. The Boston Music Hall. It is not, of course, possible that New York feels any chagrin that Boston has given the most colossal concert ever known upon the continent, but it is observable that, as wind and fire finally leveled the last timbers of the Boston Coliseum in the dust, the first step taken was taken towards the Beethoven Centennial Celebration in New York. The project is not yet matured, but a vision of something very large indeed, something metropolitan, begins to allure expectation and Boston, having scored handsomely in the game, sits upon the ruins of her Coliseum and the profits of her Jubilee to see what New York will do. If New York will build a proper hall for music and other public purposes, she will do well, and the Beethoven Centennial will not be in vain. The Cooper Institute Hall is large enough for political meetings, and Steinway Hall is good for many purposes, but it is not a beautiful nor imposing room as a great hall should be. The most impressive hall in the country is still the Boston Music Hall, where the great Hyde and the two galleries, one above the other, with the organ and the imposing statue of Beethoven, give a feeling of dignity. 
but the music hall lacks one of the chief characteristics of a noble room for the purposes to which it is devoted and that is brilliancy it is too dark there is no smiling splendor of effect which is always so enlivening the darkness of the hall may be agreeable to weak eyes it may even be described as very much better than a glare of light but brilliancy remains an indispensable quality of a great hall devoted to popular enjoyment yet whether dark or light how much has been enjoyed in that stately room what memorable figures have passed across that platform what exquisite strains of music sung played or spoken have died along those walls no one who is familiar with our history for the last twenty years will sit in the hall for any purpose but suddenly he sees it crowded with a silent and attentive throng sees a reading desk with vases of flowers and a man of sturdy figure standing behind it whose voice is deep and penetrating and sincere whose words are things who has a certain rustic shyness of movement but whose sentences roll and flash like volleys of trained soldiery and who stands in the warmth of his own emotion and the sympathy of his audience an indomitable gladiator compelling the admiration even of his enemies as he fights with the ephesian beasts against him as he stands there every sunday preaching to that vast multitude what seems to him the truth and breaking to them what he believes to be the very bread of life other men are preaching and praying and the excommunications of the vatican against luther shorn of their thunder and lightning are hurled who is he that judges motives and sincerity we do not know in this world what is believed but only what is said and done this man with bald head set low upon high square shoulders who looks firmly at the great audience through spectacles and speaks in a low half nasal tone visits the widows and fatherless and keeps himself unspotted from the world what he believes others may question what he is every aspiring soul must admire although almost every one of them would have theologically cast him out and have recoiled from him with dismay yet he preserves more than any other the traditional power and individualism of the old new england clergy he applies the eternal truth and the moral law as he feels it to the life and times around him they are heated white and his words are blows of a sledge-hammer to mould them into noble form that dauntless mien is the true symbol of his mental aspect as he confronts the menacing principalities and powers and the man whose voice has so often charmed the crowded hall is one of the few who distinctly see and foretell the terrible war long since his tongue is silent he who came of the toughest stock and might have looked to live almost a century died when it was half spent it may have seemed to the great throng easy to climb that platform and preach a sermon every sunday morning but to study early and late as if he would master all knowledge to write books lectures and speeches to travel hard by night and day losing his sleep and his food and by the dim light in the car still pushing out the frontiers of his learning to deny himself exercise and needful rest while the mental tension was so constant and the moral warfare so intense this was not easy this was to violate all the laws of life which none knew better and suddenly the stretched harp string snapped and there was no more music not every one who knew his power knew into what sweetness and tenderness it could be softened nor suspected that in the gladiator there was the loving and simple heart of the boy here as the easy chair sits listening to the orchestra it recalls the preacher when he was the minister of a rural parish and used to come strolling through the fields and patches of wood to measure his wit with the friendly scholar who was the chief at brook farm or to sit docile at his feet of counsel and sympathy or again it sees him in his country pulpit the same sturdy heroic athlete trying and tempering the weapons with which he was to fight upon this larger scene it was a noble character a devoted generous inspiring life a memory always hallowed in this hall the conductor waves his baton the symphony thunders from a hundred instruments but through them all breathes the low tone of the remembered voice fled is that music do i wait or sleep and as the concert proceeds one of the series of the harvard musical association whose concerts are the musical pride of boston at which the performance is all of the purest classical music so pure and so severe that the profane sometimes secretly ask whether melody in music is the unpardonable sin and are peremptorily answered by the elect 
No, but rub a dub dub and tum ti a diddy are not music, and as the concert proceeds, it is surely a striking spectacle. The great hall, rather dimmer than ever because of the consciousness of daylight outside, is full of people, gathered in the afternoon not only from the city, but from all the environs within twenty miles, and they sit as attentive and absorbed as a class of students at an interesting lecture. If in such a concert melody is not the unpardonable sin, whispering is. Woe betide the whisperer at a Harvard musical. It were better for him, or even her, that the money for the ticket had been expended at the minstrels or the museum. You might as well be a forger, a swindler, a perjurer, or a burglar in ordinary life, as to be a whisperer at a Harvard musical. Yes, you might as well speak right out in meeting itself, as whisper here. Such a disciplined audience, so quiet, so attentive, so susceptible to the slightest sigh of the oboe or wail of the violin, is a marvelous spectacle. They are hearing the finest and much of the freshest music in the world. They are not exactly sympathetic. Perhaps the character of the music does not permit it. They applaud calmly, as it were, with reservations. It really seems sometimes as though they approve the music rather than enjoy it. But the easy chair reflects with pride that the organizer of these concerts, if such a word may be used, and certainly with no exclusion of the cooperation which alone makes such concerts possible, is a brook farmer, and it complacently smiles upon the great multitude as unconscious pupils of that Arcadian influence. And indeed in other days in this same city of Boston, in the halcyon days of the Academy concerts at the old Odeon, or the still more ancient Boston Theater, many of the Brooks farmers were present in the flesh. Those were the days, or rather the nights, when Beethoven was truly introduced to America, preluded with the pretty Zanetta Overture by Albert, or with the Sermon, or the Domino Noir, or with Harold's shrill Zanetta, or some strain which would not now be tolerated in the Harvard concerts. The Fifth Symphony was played until it became familiar, and the long willowy Schmidt stood at the head directing, proud as a general commanding his column. In the audience, earnest, interested, attentive, sparkling with humor, was Margaret Fuller, not hesitating when the thoughtless girls whispered and tittered and giggled in the most solemn adagio strains, to lean over when the movement ended and say to the offenders, but let us have our turn, too. Some of us came to hear the music. There also was that delegation from Brook Farm, in whose appearance it was plain to see that in Arcadia the hair was worn long, that the stiff collar and cravat were repudiated, and that woolen blouses were a mute protest against the body coats of a selfish and competitive civilization. Those young fellows walked in from Brook Farm, and out again. They made nothing of ten miles or so each way under the winter stars, and with them, and of them, already accomplished, in the beautiful science, already familiar with the great works of the great composers, was the present tutelary genius of the Harvard concerts, whose life, consecrated as a critic and lover to this art, has been a true service to his city, and, reflectively, to the country. But even Boston does not deny the charm of Theodore Thomas's orchestra and the delight of the New York Philharmonic music. Indeed, there was no audience which, for its training, was more authorized to judge the great excellence of the Thomas Orchestra than that of the Harvard concerts. But when he went to Boston it was not as a doubting Thomas. He did not play Bach and Beethoven only, but he tickled the amazed multitude with positive tunes. He raised his baton in his varied orchestra, a single instrument in his magic grasp, consented to waltzes, or, like a cathedral choir becoming suddenly a lark, trilled airy roundelays at which the delighted, but not all assured of the propriety of delight, audience, smiled and shook, and the youngest catchemans even tapped time faintly with their feet, a sound which, could it be conceived audible in the midst of one of the Harvards, would probably cause such a shudder of horror that the hall itself would fall as by an earthquake. Thus the music hall itself is a kind of symphony of memories. It is full of delightful ghosts. Among the visible figures there are a host of the unseen, and every singer, player, speaker, as he stands for an hour upon the platform, is measured by the masters of his art. But in the famous Peace Jubilee it had no part. Indeed, the musical taste of which it is peculiarly the temple 
resisted the colossal and continuous concert with bells, anvils, and cannons as something monstrous, and as repulsive to true art as a huge and clumsy eastern idol. But not even the finest taste of the music hall denied the impressiveness and grandeur of the result. New York and the Beethoven Centennial will have immense advantages. The musical resources of the city are truly metropolitan, and such should the festival be. End of section 17. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 18 of From the Easy Chair, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Easy Chair, Volume 3, by George William Curtis. Section 18. Public Benefactors. There is a class of unrecognized public benefactors to which the Easy Chair wishes to offer a respectful tribute of gratitude. Their service is none the less because it is unconscious, and it is not confined to either sex. It is besides a very varied service, as will be readily seen as we advance in our description. Let us then, without delay, and to begin with, specify as benefactors of this kind the young and other gentlemen who do duty at club windows, and the ladies who kindly appear only in the latest fashions. Most men, intent upon the necessary industry wherewith they maintain their families, are content to live plainly and can seldom escape their work. There is Sunday, indeed, and a happy hour in the park, and perhaps a run in the summer for a week or two to Long Branch or the mountains. But black care generally attends as a body servant, not always or immediately recognizable, but like that solemn waiter whom Mr. George Hatter describes at a dinner given by Leach, the artist, who announced the feast with the air of an undertaker, and who proved to be the clerk of the neighboring parish, a little story which may be found, with much other entertaining reading, in a handy volume of Mr. Stoddard's Bric-a-Brac series. But the busy man's imagination is still at play, and he fancies a life which he does not know, a life of elegant and boundless leisure, which hovers above and around his weary routine, and a life in which his home is spacious and splendid, where he is clad in handsome clothes and never troubled by his tailor's bill, because he has always a balance in the bank. A life in which he opens his eyes in the morning, not to wonder if he has overslept himself, and to plunge out of bed and into his clothes and through his breakfast, to hurry to the car or omnibus, dreading to be too late. Opens his eyes, we say, not for this, but languidly to wonder as he looks from under the hangings, how most easily and pleasantly to while away the time. A wise author says that the beauty of the landscape is only a mirage seen from the windows of a diligence. So is the life of leisure which the busy man sees in fancy and in the tales which in his hasty way he sometimes reads on a rainy Sunday or in the evening. Yet it would be mere fable to him except for the benevolent genie in the club window. As he hurries homeward when his day's work is done, he lifts his eye as he passes upon the sidewalk or he peers from the omnibus window, and, lo, there stands the man to whom this leisure of his dreams is a daily reality. The figure which is making these dreams real, and which he cannot but regard as a benefactor, stands in the spacious window, and there is often a group of such figures, always with the hat on, and generally with a cane in the hand, and such garments as are only seen in the places of the fashions, and upon the tailor's lay figures. Why? Being in a warm house, he should wear his hat, when he takes it off upon entering all other houses, doth not appear. But it is part of his office to wear it. For this representative of leisure models himself upon the habits of similar ministers in those tales which the busy man sometimes reads. And as Fitzclarence Mortimer wears his hat in the club window upon Pall Mall, so must the hat be worn in our own club windows. Do not think that the hatted figure gazing at the passing ladies and carriages rolling to the park is a useless dandy. Nature wastes nothing. Nature does not inspire him to pay tailors and shoemakers and jewelers and hatters, and then to stand sucking the head of a cane in a club window without a purpose. 
the brilliancy and perfume of flowers and the song of birds as science shows are not for our delight only they serve the reproduction and perpetuity of life the final cause of that hatted figure is not the advertising of a tailor it is the effect upon the imagination it serves the end of all art it makes real to the busy citizen that life of leisure and of opportunity of which he reads and dreams nor does it end with the suggestion as the busy man goes by and beholds the apparition he reflects upon the use of such opportunity as is revealed to him at the window that man he says born to a fortune or having by faithful industry and sagacity early amassed it is now master of his life he commands time and money the two levers which are so powerful in heaving the world forward he has but to devise how he can be of service to others and obey the leading of his generous soul think of the hearths and the hearts that he cheers think of the knowledge that he acquires the studies that he pursues for the enlightenment of legislation and the practical advantage of government think how gladly he bears his part in the work of organized charities he has what so few of us have time and money he can do so much so much what can he not do so muses the busy man who must give all his day and some of the night often to earning the pittance upon which he lives and as he muses his good heart asks him why he should require everything of the hatted figure of leisure in the club window and discharge his own debt of duty by thinking how easily another can discharge his everything in its degree he says as his steps quicken with the thought one star differeth from another star in glory why because that man born in the purple or winning it can do so much can i do nothing because his whole life is that leisure of endless opportunity of which i can only dream have i no minutes no chances haunted by this thought he finds even his full-stretched day elastic he pulls it out until he too cheers some hearth and heart that would otherwise have been frozen and the busy man is busier indeed but happier and the amount of human suffering is a little less in this light does not the hatted figure at the window become a real benefactor nothing indeed is further from its mind it does not even see the busy citizen by whom it is seen but nature has attained the object for which she placed it in a window with a hat on and sucking the head of a cane End of section 18. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 19 of From the Easy Chair, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Easy Chair, Volume 3 by George William Curtis. Section 19. Mr. Tibbins' New Year's Call Mr. Tibbins wishes that his experience in making New Year's calls may be made useful as an illustration of the deceitfulness of appearances. He is one of the gentlemen who do not keep dogs, although he lives in the country, and who decline social visits to persons who do. Mr. Tibbins is, however, just and impartial. My friends, he says, shall not complain of any obscurity in my conduct. I simply offer them the alternative, me or your dog, not both. If your tastes and preferences are such that you will have large or small animals lying within your gates, yelping and growling at every person who enters, smelling at ankles and producing lively apprehensions which are not in the least allayed by calling the beast a good fellow and remarking that he was never known to bite, if, says Mr. Tibbins to his friends, these are your preferences we will not quarrel i respect your idiosyncrasies and i beg you to respect mine while i embrace this occasion to mention that among the most prominent of mine is an indisposition to have my ankles smelled at by dogs of any breed or of any size whether they are good fellows or not and an insuperable disgust with the barking of beasts when i go to make a call that it is very selfish in you or any person to subject his friends to such ordeals i do not say that I leave entirely to your own judgment, only remarking that although black snakes and green snakes are not venomous reptiles, and are probably good fellows, 
I do not think that those who delight in having them coiling and gliding about their parlors ought to be vexed with their neighbors for not calling. The line must be drawn somewhere, says Mr. Tibbins. You may not draw it until you come to snakes. I draw it at dogs. When therefore you stroll about the delightful country in his neighborhood and mark the abodes of the rich and great and say to him, That is a charming place. Mr. Tibbins answers, Yes, he has dogs, I never go there. Mr. Tibbins was naturally very much exhilarated by the hydrophobia excitement last summer and hoped at one time that the public feeling might be carefully kindled to a general crusade against dogs. I lately read in Mr. Warner's letter from the Nile, he said, of an African king who had never seen a horse until Colonel Long came riding into his capital. Think, O oh my friend, of the happy island valley of Avalon, where never a dog barked loudly or was ever seen. Of course, so severe a taste as Tibbins in a world so largely canine produces inconvenience as a dislike to butter in a society which holds to a natural and necessary relation between bread and butter, will often expose the dissenter to difficulty. Such a man in a crowded and elegant assembly who at supper has incautiously bitten a heavily buttered sandwich in the midst of a bout of bandinage with youth and beauty, understands the emotion of those who, with Mr. Tibbins, dislike to have their ankles smelled at by dogs, yet who suddenly, within a neighbor's grounds and far from help, perceive that a dog is actually engaged in that office. But Mr. Tibbins went out merrily upon New Year's morning, resolved at least to pay one visit long neglected to a neighbor who had become his neighbor the summer before, who had given no signs of dogs, and who, as Tibbins assured himself, was much too sensible a man to allow them about the house and grounds. Our friend began the day prosperously, finding everybody cordial and gay, and doing, as he thought, his full share towards the enlivenment of each call. At last he came to the new neighbors and went humming gaily up the neat plank walk from the gate, when, turning briskly around the house, putting it, as it were, between himself and retreat, he was advancing rapidly towards the front door when he suddenly stopped, with a sickening sense of betrayal, as it were, in the house of a friend. For directly before him, within easy spring, so to speak, lay a large dog upon the doormat and directly under the bell. He was asleep, and upon perceiving him Mr. Tibbins, as if upon tiptoe for silence, reconnoitred the situation. To advance and ring the bell was simple madness, for the dog would, of course, awake the moment a foot struck the step, and in the confusion of sudden awakening and of close quarters with an intruder he would probably be very reckless and sanguinary, and not in the least amenable to the good fellow blandishment. Mr. Tibbins, therefore, without moving, looked at the windows, hoping to see somebody looking out, whom he might, with beaming pantomime, summon to the door, and so save himself the contact which seemed to be inevitable. But there was no one looking out, and the closed windows seemed to him to stare with blank indifference, so that he says he had had before no idea how cruel windows can be. It then occurred to him that if he could open communication with the kitchen and entice some maid or man to the door without ringing, the difficulty would disappear, because the maid or man would pacify the dog. But to reach the kitchen required a lateral movement which would leave the enemy directly across his line of retreat. Moreover, any movement whatever exposed Mr. Tibbins to the risk of making a noise, which would arouse the foe and precipitate the engagement. He therefore maintained his position looking hopefully towards the kitchen, but, seeing no one, he reluctantly held a further counsel with himself. The obvious heroic course was to step upon the piazza and ring the bell. But he saw again that it was impossible to touch the bell without bringing himself close to the dog, who would then, of course, awake and snap immediately at the nearest object, which would be Tibbins, his leg. And what was the possible use of heroism under such circumstances? He might as well advance and kick the dog. But was the dog asleep? Was he not dead? Was he not? Why shouldn't he be a stuffed dog, an old family favorite, perhaps, now placed upon his familiar resting place as his own monument? This thought cleared the prospect for a moment, but instant gloom shut down again as Mr. Tebbins saw a slight breathing motion and perceived that the beast still lived. One of the advantages, or misfortunes, of New Year's Day in the country, according to the point of view, is the infrequency of visitors. 
to our friend this infrequency seemed to be upon this occasion a misfortune had there only been a merry group turning the corner at the moment he would have joyously joined it and so long as he could see other legs between himself and his enemy his soul would have been at rest but his position was peculiarly solitary nor did any other visitor appear and mr tebbins remained for some time motionless regarding the situation there was no sign of relief no visitor came to go in so none came out no friendly face shone at the windows no helping hand opened the door at any moment the dog might open his eyes and in that case he would certainly not be content with a survey of the situation mr tibbins who is no mean classic remembered xenophon and various other great and renowned commanders who retired in good order and not in the least demoralized and reflecting that the sage truly defined prudence as the crown of wisdom he gently turned and careful by no rude noise to disturb the peaceful slumbers of an innocent animal which some poets have suggested might properly share our heaven he tiptoed quietly around the house and rapidly descending the plank walk firmly closed the gate behind him and felt his heart swelling with gratitude for a great mercy a few days afterwards he met his neighbor and said to him that he had designed to call upon him on new year's day but that he had discovered a dog in the path and as he never called where dogs were kept he had been compelled to lose the pleasure of a visit he then told the story of his attempt in the midst of which the neighbor broke into the most prolonged and immoderate laughter and when mr tibbins had ended said to him my dear sir that dog is immemorially old and superannuated and he is blind deaf and toothless indeed replied mr tibbins but he might not have been and yet i will confess he said to the easy chair later that the incident is a very pretty sermon upon the deceitfulness of appearances which i respectfully offer to your acceptance end of section nineteen recording by philip gould section twenty of from the easy chair volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson from the easy chair volume three by george william curtis the new england sabbath there are still villages among the hills of new england we cannot call them remote hills because the locomotive darts up every valley and fills the woods upon the highest hillside with the shrill eager cry of hurrying life and bustling human society but even where the steam is heard softened and far away there are yet villages nestling in the hills in which also the old new england sabbath lingers and nestles the village street broad and arched with thick foliaged sugar maples is always still in the warm silence of a summer noon as you sit reading upon the piazza or in the shade of a tree the only moving object in the street is a load of hay slowly passing under the maples drawn by oxen or a group of loiterers in front of the village store pitching quoits the creak of the wagon the ring of the quoits or the laugh and exclamation of the players are the only sounds except indeed the musical clangor of the blacksmith's anvil as his quick hammer moulds the sparkling horseshoe or beats out the bar these are drowsy summer sounds that only emphasize the stillness of the weekday but the stillness of sunday is startling a faint tinkle of cows in the early morning filing to the pasture the warning shout of the barefooted boy who drives them are the only sounds that break the sabbath silence except again the chirp and song of birds in the trees which are no respecter of days and which sing as blithely even in the deacon's maples on sabbath morning as in the tavern ash on the fourth of july the cows pass and all is still the street is deserted save by at intervals a solitary figure upon some small errand the sun lies hot upon the pastures and hillsides there is no mail on sunday no newspaper no barber to visit now and then the men in their daily dress are seen at the barn door or in the shed or yard doing their chores they are bringing wood milking feeding the cattle but all is spectral 
there is no sound even the wind in summer fears to be a sabbath breaker it is an enchanted realm had the blue laws such vitality are we still held by their grim spell it is nine o'clock and the meeting-house bell with a bold voice of authority as if it had the sole right to disturb the silence and speak out warns the village and the outlying farms that it is the sabbath and everybody must prepare to come to meeting and the little children hear the bell with awe as if it were a living voice and sacred as part of the sabbath and to be heeded under unknown penalties obey thy father and mother thou shalt not lie thou shalt not steal thou shalt go to meeting seem to them all commandments of the first table the sound of the bell lingers in their ears and hearts as a thus saith the lord and lo at the second bell the men who have changed their daily dress and put on their sabbath clothes issue from the houses on the village street with their wives and children and through the street closely following each other and pounding along in a cloud of dust comes the long line of wagons from the farms the sun beats down remorselessly and the man in heavy woolens such as he wears in the sleigh in january sits between two women in their sabbath garments the horses trot with a sabbath jog and all turn up to the stone platform by the meeting-house upon which the women alight and the man drives the horse under the shed and then chats soberly with the others at the door but the minister passes in not clad in gown and bands and cocked hat of the older day but in plain black clothes the chatting loiterers follow him in the bell which has gathered the village into the sacred fold rests from its labors there is no one in the street there is no sound but after a few moments the music of old hundred pours out of the open doors and windows of the meeting-house sung by a well-balanced and well-trained choir it is the opening hymn and it has a full vigorous triumphant sound once more thus saith the lord there is another interval of silence but at a little distance you can hear the voice of reading and prayer hark another hymn it is federal street or coronation or dundee but whatever it is it is a strain from other years and voices and faces and scenes and days that are no more all blend in the familiar music and a sabbath benediction rests upon the listener's soul a longer silence follows broken by fragmentary sounds of energetic speech is the preacher emphasizing and elucidating the five points is he denouncing and alarming that tough regiment and woolen or winning the wondering and doubting mind is his sermon upon an official and perfunctory discourse by which little children are soothed to sleep and in which the elders like unqualified damnation and the hottest fire as a toper likes power in his dram or is his pure and manly life and conversation his true preaching and a sabbath sermon only a statement of the principles of such holy living and a revival of the colors in the immortal portrait of the holy life of the gospel before we can answer there is a burst of music then two strokes of the bell to announce that meeting is out then an issue of the congregation a procession homeward a driving away of wagons and soon once more the solitary street in the afternoon there is the sabbath school and the good pastor preaches at one of the schoolhouses in a farther part of the town but it is always the sabbath in every sight and sound until the sun has set and then from the neighboring house upon the hill above the village street comes a clear resonant soprano voice singing hymns and prolonging the solemn spell of the holy day the tithing men are gone and the deacons do not sit severe and conspicuous in the meeting-house and the minister has not the air of a lord spiritual of the village and the genius of modern times and the spirit of the age are entertained with full consciousness of what they are but it is still the sober and constrained and decorous new england sabbath which recurs every seventh day and the honest industrious intelligent self-respecting plain living village recalls remotely the day of the severer dispensation and illustrates the noble manhood that the severe dispensation fostered in the section twenty
Section 21 of From the Easy Chair, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by D.L. Archer. From the Easy Chair, Volume 3, by George William Curtis. Section 21. The Reunion of Anti-Slavery Veterans, 1884. On a pleasant day and evening during the autumn, a few venerable greybeards and bald heads met in a church in the city and sang and spoke and told old tales of former meetings and rejoiced that they had not died before their eyes had seen the glory. The meeting produced no ripple upon the surface of the city life. The newspapers printed brief reports of it among the other city news, but the return of the Philadelphia baseball players and the mill between Sullivan and other bruisers challenged very much more space and a very much more public attention. Yet fifty years before, when those gray beards were brown and those bald heads were shaggy as Samson's, their meeting convulsed the city and occasioned a riot which was the precursor of similar desperate disturbances and the forerunner of one of the greatest of civil wars. The meeting was then denounced in advance in double-leaded editorials, which were the direct and doubtless the intentional incitements to bloodshed and the subversion of popular rights. For the popular right, which is the foundation of all other rights, is that of free speech. The mere announcement of the meeting drew a vast and excited throng to prevent it. Men of standing in the community made themselves leaders of the mob and occupied in advance the entrance to the hall where it was to take place. The proprietors of the hall, appalled by the evidences of furious hostility to the meeting and its purposes, refused to open it to those who had engaged it, and they went elsewhere. But the obstructing mob did not relax their purpose. They hastened to another hall where men of respected and even noted means harangued them violently, introducing resolutions decrying the purpose of the original meeting and suddenly hearing that the projectors were assembled elsewhere the crowd rushed wildly to the place which was a small chapel and swarming and eager for crime found the chapel deserted the holders of the meeting had accomplished their object and retired from the rear of the building as the mob burst in through the front doors the press of the city with one or two notable exceptions the next morning celebrated the intended suppression of a peaceful meeting by an angry mob as if it had been a national victory over piratical invaders it denounced the leaders of the meeting with a malignant bitterness with which the familiars of the inquisition might have anathematized luther and his friends and the few voices in the papers which protested against treating the holders of the meeting with violence yet spoke of them in a strain of abhorrence which virtually branded them as public enemies. Who were these dangerous and desperate men whose mere proposal to meet and organize themselves for a purpose which was plainly declared, and which was to be sought by legal methods only, had so profoundly disturbed the city and startled the press into sounding a furious alarm? They were a few persons who asserted the principles of the Declaration of Independence and demanded that all Americans should enjoy the rights which the Declaration affirmed to belong to all men. The object of the meeting was the formation of a city anti-slavery society, and those who assembled in October of this year were the survivors of that meeting. Their object has been accomplished, and the views whose announcement fifty years ago convulsed the city are now common places of universal acceptance. It would be incredible that the sentiment of the city with an easy memory of men living was so hostile to the American principle and its fundamental guarantees if a still later experience had not illustrated the same hostility. It seems almost cruel to recall the names of those who spoke of the purposes of men who proposed to appeal to public opinion against a monstrous public wrong, and of the men themselves as the folly madness and mischief of these bold and dangerous men and as persons who owe what notoriety they have to their love of meddling with agitating subjects this was the way in which those who thought themselves to be in the van of freedom and of civilization spoke of the beginning of one of the great historic movements in the progress of the race and of the men who took up the work of the fathers of the country to carry it further and logically forward 
It was with this stupid and insolent contempt that the press, which prided itself upon its liberty, and in a country which guaranteed the right of free, peaceful assembly and free speech, struck at both of them as fatal to the common welfare. Had Philip II and the sanguinary Alva controlled the press in the Netherlands three centuries ago, they would have denounced the beginning of the great contest with the black despotism of the Inquisition in the same tone of vindictive hatred and disdain with which that little meeting at the Chatham Street Chapel was assailed by the press of New York in 1833. It is no wonder that the pioneers of that famous evening wished to come together upon its fiftieth anniversary to rejoice that they had entered into the promised land. The fact that their meeting excited no general interest and was almost unobserved was the evidence of the completeness of their triumph. Their folly, madness, and mischief have become patriotic wisdom. The bold and dangerous men have grown into a mighty nation. And for the brethren of the press, that anniversary has some very significant suggestions. First and chief is the consideration that the spirit of the newspapers, and not the meeting in Chatham Street Chapel, was a dangerous spirit. There is no blacker traitor to popular institutions than the man who incites an angry mob against peaceful meetings and free speech. Free speech is precious not for popular, but for unpopular opinions. It is to secure in the land of Inquisition a voice against the Inquisition, in the land of slavery a voice for liberty. That freedom has overthrown these two tyrants by developing a public opinion which has made them impossible. The first duty of a free press is to defend the right of the free assertion of unpopular opinions, however dangerous they may seem, to government or to society and it is but just to record that the only paper in new york which when this old coat was new stated clearly and conclusively the true principle upon this subject was the journal of commerce if among the exulting crowd that welcomed king william of glorious and happy memory to england a spectator had seen the flowing white locks of some old soldier of cromwell's ironsides as the men of Hadley were fabled to have seen the venerable head of Goff, the regicide, suddenly appearing as their deliverer, he would have felt his heart throbbing with gratitude as the vision of one of the heroes who founded the liberty which William came to complete. So some musing observer in the church where the reverend Greybeards met to renew their friendship and to tell their story might well have gazed with gratitude. Amid the peace and prosperity of the country, upon the thinned and thinning remnant of that old guard whose constancy and devotion made that peace and prosperity possible. End of section. Recording by D. L. Archer. End of From the Easy Chair, Volume 3, by George William Curtis. Section 22 of From the Easy Chair, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Easy Chair, Volume 3, by George William Curtis. Section 22. Reform Charity. The State Board of Charities in New York would deal severely with Elia if it found him upon the street, stammering out his admiration of the fine histrionic powers of a beggar, and searching in his pocket for a penny. Lamb said that it was shameful to pay a crown for a seat in the theatre to enjoy the representation of woes that you knew to be fictitious, and to grudge a sixpence to the street performer who was so excellent that you could not tell whether his sufferings were real or affected. He is undoubtedly responsible for a great deal of easy and irresponsible almsgiving, which greatly increases human suffering and the expense of society. It is not possible to conceive anything more comical than Lamb's probable reception of a politico-economical or scientific view of charity. He would have felt his genius for humor to be hopelessly surpassed. His view would have been the ludicrous aspect of the idea which is more solemnly held by those who regard ordinary almsgiving as one of the cardinal virtues, and who have a vague conviction that a liberal disbursement of money to the poor in this world is a strong lean upon endless felicity in the next. There is indeed something very affecting in the old picture of conventional charity. The groups of disabled and destitute assembling at the great gate or in the courtyard, 
and the benign priests distributing food and clothing. And there is a similar picturesque interest in the ancient English bounties. A trust which secures to every wayfarer who may demand it a loaf of bread or a mug of beer. That charity meant this and nothing more was long the conviction, as it was the tradition of society. It was thought to have the highest Christian sanction. There were to be always poor among us. The poor were to be relieved, and relief or charity consists in feeding the hungry and clothing the naked. Yet out of that simple, unreflected, seemingly innocent faith have sprung enormous suffering, demoralization, and crime. The whole subject of charitable relief was as misunderstood as that of penal imprisonment before John Howard. There will be criminals, was the theory, and they must be punished. They must therefore be secured in jails, and the object of imprisonment is intimidation from crime, not the improvement of criminals. The result of this view was that society dismissed the subject and regarded prisoners as mere outcasts, so that the inhumanity of their treatment was revolting. Happily the neglect revenged itself. The jails became sores. They were nurseries of loathsome disease. Judges and sheriffs were smitten by the pestilence that exhaled from prisons, and John Howard, like a purifying angel in cleansing the prisons, began also to cleanse society. So almsgiving and the relief of the poor arrested the attention of humane persons who were not content with Elia's philosophy. They had sometimes watched the skillful street performer, and had seen him slip round the corner and spend at the gin palace in a dram the money which, with some fine histrionic genius, he had besought for the sick wife and the starving children. They found the wife was also an accomplished histrion, and that the children were receiving parental instruction in the same calling. They found that the amiable, careless, unquestioning almsgiving was breeding a class of paupers, people who did not seek work nor wish to work, but who lived and who meant to live by beggary, who bred their children to do likewise, and whose haunts and associations and habit became great nurseries of crime. The evil had become enormous and was most deeply seated before it was accurately observed. But wise men and wise women everywhere are now, and for some years have been, earnestly engaged in studying how to save society from the curse of pauperism, while taking care that all helpless and innocent suffering shall be relieved. This is what Elia and his amiable, thoughtless friends denounce as machine charity. But their amiability is only selfishness. How many of those who decry machine charity ever went home with a single street beggar to whom they gave? or ever ascertained or cared whether his story was true, or told for any other purpose than to get the price of a dram. What they call their Christian charity in common humanity and apostolic almsgiving is often mere fostering of lying, drunkenness, and crime, and the indefinite increase of suffering. It is upon this spirit that knaves and charlatans play and pray in establishing great charitable agencies, of which they are managers and in the vivid French phrase, touch the funds. There are thousands of kind-hearted people in every city who devote a share of their income to charity. They know that there is immense suffering, and they would gladly do their share in relieving it, but they do not know how to do it. They are conscious that there is deception upon all sides, and they cannot spare the time to ascertain for themselves who, of the host of the poor, are proper objects of charity. But it is only less difficult to decide upon a trusty agency. Here is the chance of the ingenious and plausible rascal. If he can only obtain the cooperation of those whose names make societies respectable, and who will permit him to be the society, and especially to disperse the monies, he will be as satisfied as Ferdinand Count Fathom with any of his little games. It is not always difficult for such a rascal to secure the conditions of his success. The consequences are both lamentable and ludicrous, for under this solemn form of a Christian charitable foundation the most selfish purposes are served, and when the mischief is exposed it is denounced as one of the abuses to which delegated or machine charity is inevitably liable. To perfect the comedy, this criticism is usually made by those whose own alms are generally transferred from their pockets directly to the till of the dram shop. It is evident from the letters that have been written to the newspapers during the winter that there are those who sincerely think that careful inquiry regarding poverty, and regulations of relief based upon it, 
must somehow deaden human sympathy and deepen the suffering of the poor. This is so ingeniously incorrect a theory that it would be exceedingly amusing if it were not so sincere and even general. The very first thing that careful investigation accomplishes is to acquaint the comfortable class with the real condition of the suffering, and to show the latter that they are not forsaken or turned off with uninquiring alms. They are conscious of an intelligent sympathy with which falsehood will be of no avail. They are taught self-respect by the perception that they are not forsaken, and self-respect is the mainspring of successful exertion. When the street beggar understands that his tale will be tested, that if he needs succor he will receive it, and that if his plea is but asking for a dram he will not receive it, the number of street beggars will sensibly decrease. And the sturdy tramp and professional pauper, when they know that they must go to the workhouse or starve, will often conclude that even work is better than the poorhouse, and they too will cease to be a nuisance and a terror. Nor need it be feared, on the other hand, that if irresponsible street giving is stopped, no one will investigate the actual situation of the poor. What is asked of the street giver is not that he will close his pocket in his hand and his heart and his soul but that if he will not take the trouble to inquire before giving, he will give his alms to somebody who will take that trouble, that his alms may be true charity and relieve suffering, instead of relieving nothing whatever but fostering vice and crime. He must see that he is not a good Christian exercising the heavenly gift of charity, but an indolent and reckless citizen who is promoting poverty and multiplying the public burden of the honest poor. He is that lazy, absurd boy who wishes to eat his cake and have it, he would satisfy his soul that he is good because he gives without seeing that to give ignorantly is socially to be bad. Nobody is exhorted to surrender inquiry to others. Everyone may inquire for himself. If a beggar stops you and asks for a penny in the name of God and says that his family is starving, go and see if it is so. If you have not the time, O oh sophistical cyberite, inclination, Send him to those who, as you know, will inquire. Will his family starve in the meantime? That is something you do not believe yourself. Do you fear that the visitor will not go? Then go yourself. Do your engagements prevent? Then you know that it is a thousand to one, the story is but a plea for whiskey. Will you take the chance? Then you become an immediate accomplice in the vast multiplication of hereditary pauperism and crime. The pretense of your giving is Christian charity and humanity. The real cause is indolent self-indulgence and saving yourself trouble. The charity that is beautiful in the old stories is actual charity. It is the friendly feeding of those who are really hungry and the clothing of those who shiver with the cold. The Elias charity is only a refined selfishness, a whim of humor. He rewarded the deceit. He did not relieve the suffering. Of course his plea was an exquisite jest, and so he felt it to be. But his jest is made earnest and changed into a sober rule of life by the gentle Sybarites, who, if ever they have heard of the Englishman Edward Denison, are lost in amazement and cigarette smoke as they meditate his career. The story may be found in a tender and graphic sketch in the entertaining volume of papers by the author of the admirable History of the English People, J. R. Green. Edward Denison, born in 1840, was the son of the Bishop of Salisbury and nephew of the Speaker, and was educated at Oxford. Then he travelled on the continent, and studied the condition of the Swiss peasantry. Returning to England, he engaged practically in the work of poor relief as an almoner of a charitable society. He soon learned the uselessness of relief by doles, and determined to deal with the subject thoroughly. He withdrew from the clubs, Pall Mall and Mayfair, and taking lodgings in Stepney made himself the friend of the poor, built and endowed a school in which he taught, gave lectures, and organized a self-helping relief. He went to France and to Scotland to study their poor law systems. In 1868 he was elected to Parliament where his knowledge of the general subject would have been invaluable, but his health failed before he took his seat. He sailed for Melbourne, still intent upon his life's purpose, and died there seven years ago in his thirtieth year. A little volume of his letters has been published, and Mr. Green's affectionate and pathetic sketch draws the outline of this true modern knight and gentleman, the Sir Launfall of his time. The street-giver, seeking a rule of conduct, may more profitably heed the counsel of Edward Denison 
than the delicious humor of Charles Lamb. End of section 22. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 23 from The Easy Chair, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From The Easy Chair, Volume 3 by George William Curtis. Section 23. Bicycle Riding for Children. There has been some joking over Mr. Gary's proposal to bring Mr. Barnum to legal judgment for violating the statute in exhibiting the young riders upon the bicycle. Mr. Barnum invited a distinguished company, including eminent physicians, to witness the performance. The physicians added that it was no more than healthful exercise. Thereupon the cynics, who have never given a thought or lifted a hand to relieve suffering or to remedy wrong, sneer at serviceable philanthropy. Mr. Berg also complained of the killing of the elephant pilot, and when the matter was explained, there was contemptuous chuckling at the sentimental tomfoolery of philanthropic busybodies, and the usual exhortation to reformers to supply themselves with common sense. But meantime, the mere knowledge that there is an association for the protection of children from cruelty, and another for the defense of animals against human brutes, is in itself a protection for both classes of victims. No parent or employer can wreak his vengeance or ill temper upon a child. No driver or owner can torment an animal without the consciousness that some agent may learn of it, or perhaps see it, and bring the offender to justice. Both of these movements, at which first seemed to many intelligent persons to be strange and impractical fancies, are among the greatest proofs of the deeper and wiser humanity of the age. These are illustrations of the same spirit which organizes charities and ameliorates penal systems. Mr. Berg and Mr. Gary are in the right line of moral descent from John Howard and Sir Samuel Romilly, and Mrs. Fry, and Miss Carpenter. And when Mr. McCaster brings his history of the American people down to the last decade, he will record the purpose and work of the two modest societies as among the striking illustrations of the actual progress of that people. It is in Lecky's detailed account of the horrible carelessness and suffering of the inhuman desertion of prisoners and the poor of the last century in England that we get the true key to the actual condition of the country. Mr. McCaster has thrown a similar light upon the same inhumanity in this country a hundred years ago. Yet every endeavor to correct that inhumanity, to remember the man in the criminal, and to wisely succor the brother and the beggar, has been greeted as an effort to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, to make water run uphill, as the rose-water philanthropy and the coddling of scoundrels, by the same spirit which sneers at the work of Mr. Gary and Mr. Berg. Left to that spirit, England would be today where it was a hundred and fifty years ago, and the signal triumphs of the century would have been unwon. Such a spirit is mingled of ignorance, cowardice, and stupid selfishness. It is always the obstruction of advancing humanity, always the contempt of generous and courageous minds. It is true, undoubtedly, that every forward step is not wisely taken, and that there are the most absurd parodies of philanthropy, as well as a great deal of pseudo-philanthropy, which is merely the mask of knavery. We have taken great pleasure in these very columns in stripping off sundry masks of philanthropy, which is pursued by impostors of both sexes in this city. Common sense, careful scrutiny, and intelligence are indispensable in every form of charity and beneficence. But because of the conduct of Shepherd Cowley, shall nothing be done for the relief of wretched children? Because of the elaborate system of fraudulent charity of the Reverend Knave who has been exposed here and elsewhere, shall the poor be left without succor? Everything said and done by the friends of societies for protecting children and animals may not be wise, but there could be nothing more exquisitely ridiculous than to deride the societies and their labors for that reason. Those who lead the van of reforms are so much in earnest that they must sometimes offend, sometimes mistake, 
or nothing would ever be done emerson says that if providence is resolved to achieve a result it overloads the tendency this produces enthusiasm and fanaticism and also the indomitable devotion and energy which cannot be defeated it is when the new way to the indies becomes his one idea that columbus discovers america it is when luther defies all the opposing devils although they are as many as the tiles upon the roofs that he establishes protestantism the doctors and the distinguished company decide upon mr geary's complaint that the bicycle riding of the children at barnum's is healthful not injurious and to mr berg's remonstrance about killing the elephant pilot mr barnum replies that he is not likely to inflict a serious loss upon himself by killing one of his animals unless it were clearly necessary all this may be conceded but it is very fortunate for the community that there are sentinels of humanity who will summarily challenge and compel a clear and complete explanation it appears that the riding of children is not harmful and the court dismisses mr geary's complaint the result is not that mr geary is left in a questionable position but that every circus manager and every exhibitor of children knows that a vigilant eye watches his conduct and that a prompt hand will deal even with seeming cruelty and severity and exposure it is very possible that pilot was dispatched as humanely as practicable but mr berg's challenge was not an impertinent intermeddling it reminds every brute in the city that he cannot lose his temper and kick his horse with impunity both acts establish a moral consciousness of constant surveillance which stays the angry hand and succors the limping animal and the friendless child it is those who relieve pain and suffering not those who laugh at their zeal whom history remembers and mankind blesses End of section 23